So Xenoblade Chronicles 3 has been out for like a week now, and we have some thoughts to share with you all. The first of which is Holy Spark. Now is that a good Holy Spark or a bad Holy Spark? Well, I guess you'll just have to keep watching to find out. This video is going to be 100% spoiler free by the way, so if you're planning on picking it up but you haven't yet, or you're still on the fence about it, then you've come to the right place. Before we get into all of that though, we'd really appreciate it if you gave this video a thumbs up. And if you like Nintendo things, you definitely won't regret subscribing because we also like Nintendo things. Go on, don't be shy. So allegedly Xenoblade 3 is like a billion hours long and it somehow just doesn't feel right to review a game when you're only like 10% through it. But if you're not enjoying it in the first 10%, then you're probably not going to stick with it for the following 90, are you? So these are just our initial thoughts and hopefully we can answer that burning question. Has Xenoblade 3 lived up to the hype? So we'll kick things off here with the world building. And this is probably the place where this game shines the brightest. After just the initial opening cutscene, you'll feel fully immersed in its hauntingly beautiful world. Now we say hauntingly because yes, while the setting is reminiscent of the box art with the luscious green fields and the blue skies, the themes here are anything but. They provide an extremely dark contrast and Xenoblade wastes no time in getting straight to the point. Mortality, war, and what it means to simply exist are some of the major players in this title. I personally love it when a game dives headfirst into some really heavy hitters. People shouldn't be afraid to tackle those big issues, you know, and Monolith Soft definitely isn't. All of these themes are obviously set in a fictional world, so it's not like the studio gets political or anything. They just tackle death in a super unique way. So basically, people live for a maximum of 10 years. And they spend these 10 years trying to steal life from the opposing nation by slaughtering them on the battlefield. Eat, sleep, slay, and repeat. While it is easy to draw real life comparisons to the nine to five consumerist machine, there is no doubt that this is a high fantasy scenario. And that's the best thing about it. If you wanna spend hours thinking about Xenoblade's themes, then you can. But if you just want a story to take you far away from real life, then you've also got that. I wish that I could have written essays on video games in university because there's so much good content there. Now that we've banged on about the world and its tone, what about the people that inhabit said world? Well, Monolith Soft has also done a fantastic job in their character building. Just like you feel instantly immersed in the setting, you also feel instantly attached to these characters. Not to mention that their designs are snuffing incredible. Like just take a look at this guy. You can't tell me that this guy doesn't look freaking awesome. So you play as this guy called Noah. You're eventually able to control anyone in your party, but there's no doubt that he's the main character. Noah's seemingly the first guy to question the life that's laid out in front of him. In a world filled to the brim with violence, he's seemingly the only one who's afraid, the only one with compassion, and the only one with an understanding that the enemy are just people like him. It's these traits that make him so easy to care about as a player, and they also make him the perfect hero. Noah, as great as he is, isn't the only character though. Each new person you meet or interact with, even briefly, is so well thought out. Every one of your party members has a uniquely distinct personality, and the relationships between them are not just realistic, but genuinely captivating. Now a few hours into the game, there are these three characters that kind of just show up and get shoved into the story. And at first I was like, I don't care about these people, but I think that's kind of the point. At first you're not meant to care about them, but as you spend more time with them, you learn a lot about them through their interactions with others and through flashbacks of their own lives. To take something that I initially thought was a complaint and turn it into a strength was pretty cool. Okay, so surprise, surprise, the story in an RPG is amazing. That's kind of an RPG's thing, right? To make you feel like you're role-playing in a video game, but, How's the gameplay? Now this is where things get a little bit more subjective because we will admit that it's not for everyone. The battle system here is definitely the make or break. And to be honest, it's probably the only reason that you might not like this game. So the Xenoblade Chronicles series has always been about these kind of auto battles. You walk up to an enemy and you'll start instantly attacking them without you having to press any buttons. Sounds a little bit slow, right? I would be lying to you if I said that I wasn't skeptical, like props to the devs for trying something unique, but is it fun? I think so. I'm going to say yes. Yes, it is fun. So while Laura's right, you do just simply auto attack. 
there is more than enough to do to keep the battle system entertaining. It actually ends up being a little bit convoluted, but the game does do a great job of drip feeding you these mechanics so it's not too overwhelming. At the beginning, it is a little slow. All you're doing is executing special attacks or arts. Now, timing and the position of your characters in relation to your enemies are both super important here, but we definitely had some time to pad our cat mid-battle. It's not too long though before you unlock a whole bunch more battle mechanics. Chain attacks, Aurora Boris forms, extra arts, battle commands. The UI ends up looking pretty darn busy actually. My biggest question though was do you actually have to play? Like can you just walk up to an enemy and rely on the auto attacks to win it for you? Unfortunately the answer is sometimes yes. Here's Tom on a story quest doing absolutely nothing and winning. Yes this is early on and yes you can increase the difficulty but I don't know. I don't blame you if this turns you off. Nah, I just see it as like one hit KOing a weaker enemy in a more traditional turn based system. You know how in Pokemon when you take on a crappy bug type Pokemon and you just instantly kill it with your first flamethrower? Yeah, it's, it's like that. I really like the battle system and for the most part, you do have to actually play it not to die. It's just like the weaker enemies. I don't know, maybe if there was like a demo in the eShop or something and you could try it out for yourself first, that would be the best option. Nintendo, this game needs a demo. One of the Xenoblade games. Does it have a demo? Shit, maybe it has a demo. <laughs> Someone's gonna fact check that for me. I'm gonna be wrong, I know it. Xenoblade 3 is a fully realized open world experience. So apart from the battles, you'll spend a lot of time exploring, taking sides in random fights and completing side quests. There's a whole lot of stuff to do and find, and the game does a really good job at rewarding exploration. All in all, the gameplay is pretty darn good. Maybe not a perfect 10 like the story and the design, but a solid 7 to 8 for sure. Just quickly before we move on from gameplay, it is worth mentioning that the tutorials in this game are pretty vast. There is a lot to learn, but in our opinion, the pacing is handled extremely well. At times it can feel a little handholdy. But honestly, all the tutorials are super necessary. Yeah, they slowly drop new mechanics on you over the first 10-ish hours, so you're not overwhelmed. It also means that the first two hours aren't entirely tutorial, so you can actually enjoy the game from the beginning. But if you're hardcore and you don't want the mechanics explained to you, you can always turn them off in the settings. Alright, so now we're going to move on to what in my opinion is the best thing about Xenoblade 3. The music. This soundtrack really cranks it up to 11, man. Like, holy sh**, it slaps, dude. <laughs> yeah, Tom really likes music in case you didn't know already. So even the piano track on the title screen is just like, whoa. There is so much emotion that's invoked from but a single instrument. And it only gets better from there. Piano isn't your thing? Well, listen to this incredible bass run that kicks off a regular old fight. Like, this would be boss music in any other game. The amount of genres this thing spans is also pretty incredible. There's a whole bunch of tracks that would feel right at home on a Nightwish album, if Nightwish had Jimi Hendrix in the band. So orchestral elements are there, and shredding metal elements are there, but let's say you prefer electronic music. That's chill because there is plenty of dark, almost dubstepy stuff here too. And finally, there's a lot of tracks that feel almost folky. Our main character Noah is what people call a seer. It's essentially his job to guide the spirits of the dead through the music of his flute. You can tell that the audio designers took this on board as there are a hell of a lot of wind instruments used throughout the soundtrack, hence the folky vibe. Honestly, if you're a music fan, you're gonna have a great time here regardless of anything else. Here's a scene where the music literally made me shed a tear and I am so not ashamed of it.
Xenoblade 3 pushes the Nintendo Switch to its absolute limits. There ends up being so much stuff on screen that it's pretty amazing that this outdated hardware can even keep up. The size and scope of this game is huge. The fact that the final size is only 15 gigabytes is super impressive. There's actually been a bit of a stir online with people being like, I wish this game was on PC or I wish it was in 4K on the PS5. All right, we definitely admit that it would undoubtedly look amazing in 4K. But if you don't wanna play a game just because it doesn't run at 60 frames per second, I'm sorry, but you're just missing out for no good reason. Like, why would you hold yourself back like that? Almost every other part of a game is more important than graphical fidelity. And Xenoblade doesn't even look bad. It looks great. <sighs> it looks like Monolith Soft and Nintendo have a real winner on their hands with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. With a Metacritic score of 89, this might even be Game of the Year contender. Opening week sales are also looking pretty good, so there is no doubt that Xenoblade has now solidified itself as one of Nintendo's top tier franchises. Putting 100 plus hours of your life into anything is a daunting task, let alone spending that time staring at your Switch. But this story is doing such a good job of giving us equal parts questions and answers that we can already tell it's going to be 100 hours well spent. If you're an RPG fan and you haven't checked out the Xenoblade titles yet, then we implore you to do so. Even if the other two games weren't for you, there are plenty of people saying that number three is the winner. And you don't have to have played the other games either. This is a completely self-contained story, and while there are nods to one and two, you won't be missing out on anything. In short, after only scratching the surface of this title, we can confidently say that we definitely snuffing recommend it. Unless something drastic happens, then expect this one to pop up again in our end of year best games of 2022 video. As usual though, let us know what you think in the comments. Will you be picking up Xenoblade Chronicles 3 or do RPGs just not interest you at all? Thank you so much for hanging out with us again. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next week. Bye. Peace. Do not cry.